Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Sarian and I am here today with my dad, Greg Sarian, to speak with all of you about the Armenian people, the Armenian genocide, and why this is relevant today, uh, the current political situation, and in addition you will hear an amazing story of my great-grandma Anna Manugian and her struggle for survival during the Armenian genocide. Everyone can hear me? Okay. All right, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, Ms. McGrory and uh, Mr. Simpson for, uh, for having me today. Um, so today we're gonna talk about Armenian genocide. It's kind of a, a difficult topic to be quite honest with you, but I think, uh, I think together we'll, we'll, we'll get through it. So uh, we'll just uh, kind of get right into it. Um, so here's our agenda today. And uh, we'll start with um, who are the Armenians. So if you have a kind of a map hanging up in your basement at home or in your social studies class, you'll see the map of Turkey and Syria, Iraq and Iran. That's the Middle East down here, Egypt. And Russia is up there. And this is all of what is called Turkey today. And this red spot is Armenia today. So um, it's a lot smaller than it used to be, and we're going to talk about why. But if you can make out the red line here, if you can make that out and over here, that's actually Armenia. That's all historic Armenia. Um, today, it's called Turkey, but um, hopefully we'll get um, real into the details in terms of why that's actually Ar Armenia, and you'll, you'll understand. Here's a picture, kind of a helicopter view. Um, you can see Mount Ararat. Um, this is actually with us the story of uh, Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark landed in Mount Ararat. Um, and this is kind of the main um, city. You can see some snow on top of the building, so kind of a wintertime shot there. Um, the valley right here um, at the base of Mount Ararat is believed to be inhabited since the Stone Age. So it's actually one of the earliest settled regions in the entire world, if you go back in, in, uh, in history. Also, the Armenians were the first Christians. The very first Bible was actually written in Armenian. Um, Armenia was also part of the Soviet Union from 1922 to 1991. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, Armenia became independent um, from 1991 as, as it is right up till today. Um, the, the Ottoman Empire is really what I, I showed before, with, uh, which made up Turkey. Back then it was called the Ottoman Empire. It was the Turkish people lived there as, as well as minority Christians, the Armenians being one of those minority Christian groups. Um, the Armenians at that time were kind of known as the, the intellectual um, center of the Ottoman Empire. So you had your doctors, your lawyers, your intellects, your scholars, your composers, your artists. Um, Armenians were pretty much those types of folks. Um, and you can see Armenia had its own alphabet, if you can make that out. Those little uh, scribbles there are the, are the, uh, are the uh, alphabet. Um, Armenia has its own unique flag, which is red, blue, and orange. And also the capital of Armenia is called Yerevan, as it is today. Now, I don't know if you can make this out, but um, Armenians are very well known for their food. I get hungry just looking at this slide. <laughs> so um, if you like lamb, uh, you know, maybe you don't, but if you do, um, that's lamb shish kebab. It's on a um, bed of rice pilaf, which of course I had to have a close up of. And uh, this is called doma. It's uh, grape leaves stuffed with uh, meat and uh, um, kind of uh, rice and uh, spices. It's very good. Um, this is called lakmajun. It's like a, kind of like an Armenian pizza. It has beef, lamb, um, pork. It's all grinded up with different spices on kind of a flat bread. Um, more food. <laughs> I'm like the only presenter that you'll get two slides of food. Um, so here's some bread. My mom used to make this, and when the windows were open where we were growing up, all the neighbors be knocking on the door and asking Rose to, to have a few for themselves. Uh, more bread, uh, th this is uh, very kind of slicely uh, thin cut meat that uh, you can fry up with eggs, it's called bastama. Um, you have to kind of have a strong stomach for that, but it's real tasty. 
uh, and then you move on to the desserts, which um, are just about heaven, if, if, you can, if you, you can ever find some of that. Um, Armenia has its own unique dance and art. Um, are you guys able to see the screen okay? It's maybe too light, or you, you can make it out. So this is a little bit more of the traditional dancing. Um, in Yerevan, if you go to like a big uh, theater in Yerevan, uh, or anywhere in the world where there's an Armenian ensemble playing, you'll see the folks kind of look like that. Um, but quite honestly, if you go to like a wedding, an Armenian wedding, this is more of what you'll see. The people kind of join with the, with the pinkies, and they have a line, or they'll have a circle, um, and they'll dance. Also, the Armenians were the very first ones to discover wine. Um, so it actually wasn't the French, uh, believe it or not. Um, this, they discovered a wine press, fermentation vats, jars, cups in one of the caves in Armenia. So they were the first ones to come up with wine. One of the first countries to invent yogurt and uh, coffee. Remember that commercial that used to be, I don't know, a couple of years ago with the old people dancing with the hats and, you know, the, the yogurt commercial. They <laughs> kind of reminded me of some folks in my family. Um, and then they, they make great cognac, and uh, if you like apricots, they have fields and fields and acres and acres of apricots, kind of known as like the best apricots in, in the world. It's also home to the world's longest nonstop double track cable car. Kind of a nice picture because it gives you another view of, of the landscape of Armenia. You can see how mountainous it is. Um, if you're not afraid of heights, and if you ever make it to that part of the world, probably be a pretty cool thing to, uh, to check out. Okay. So, um, you can see here, um, this Gothic style of church. Um, it was something that the Armenians designed in the Ottoman Empire century before it, would ever, it was ever in Europe. So if you've ever had the opportunity to go to Europe, you'll see this type of architecture all over the place. A century before Europe, the Armenians designed that. And basically, um, when you say, when you take a look at that church and um, you see it now, why a church like that now looks like this, times many, many, many churches. That's just one example. And we'll talk about, we'll talk about why. So um, before we get into what actually happened in the genocide, let's talk about what genocide is. Again, it's not a very pretty thing to talk about, but I, I hold nothing back today. I'm going to talk about it and show you pictures so, so you know. So basically, genocide means with the intent, this is knowingly, to destroy in whole or in part an entire race of people. Okay. Uh, national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, in whole or in part. So even if it's not the whole society, if the intention is to even destroy part of it, this, this is what the, uh, the, 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 the folks who are doing it are looking to do. It's deliberately inflicting on a group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical end. Very ugly stuff. It's imposing measures intended to prevent births or forcibly transferring children of one group to, to another against their will. Raphael Lemkin um, was the person who actually came up with the word genocide. He created that word. He's the person that actually invented the word, and he invented it when? He invented it in 1944. But the Armenian genocide happened in 1915. So he was a law professor at Yale University. And he knew what happened to the Armenians. And he was seeing what was just about to happen with Hitler. And he said, it's happened already. It shouldn't happen again. And he came up with the word genocide to make it a crime. OK? It's an international crime to commit genocide. Before he came up with that word, there wasn't an international crime. You can think, well, a massacre and murder is against the law. That's true. It's against the law. But within a country, they have their own laws. 
So you're an outside country looking at an inside country killing people. Uh, if they say it's okay, because their government deems it okay, who goes to jail? No one goes to jail. Raphael Lemkin was in class one day, just like you guys are, and he said, that ain't right. And he came up with this word to make it a crime. So that's very important to understand that genocide is an international crime. Andrew, why don't we play uh, Raphael Lemkin? You'll hear him talk about the Armenians a couple of times. Very cute. <laughs> that genocide is a new word to combine. The Greek word genos, genos meaning race or group, with the roots of the Latin sedere meaning to kill. Dr. Raphael Lemkin, who is a professor of law at Yale University and specializing in teaching uh, matters about the United Nations, Dr. Lemkin is the man who created the word genocide. Dr. Lemkin, could you give us a little background on how you came to be interested in this genocide? We became interested in genocide because it happened so many times. It happened to the Armenians, and uh, after the Armenians, Hitler took action. Lemkin became the leading force behind the drafting and adoption of the International Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, adopted unanimously by the United Nations General Assembly in Paris on December 9, 1948. I would have okay. uh, think that's the spirit, the unanimous view of the Assembly. Okay, so what did we hear Lemkin say? He said it happened to the Armenians, okay? Did he have any motivation to say it? Was he Armenian? Was he getting, gaining political ground by saying that? No, he was a law professor, and he said it because it happened. That's why he said it. And he was witnessing was it, what was about to happen with Hitler. And so, you know, having seen it happen to the Armenians, he didn't want to see it happen again. So in 40, 1944, he came up with the term genocide. He created that term. It's now an international crime. And this was his part in trying to stop what was about to happen with the, with the, with the Jewish uh, people. OK, so we can talk about genocide all day long. But unless you really personalize it and visualize it, what is it? Right? It's just a word. So here I appeal to your sense of um, visibility and, you know, kind of, uh, kind of a visionary uh, uh, piece here. So just if you can actually imagine you're at home, this is Hunterdon County, it's pretty tough to imagine it, but if you're home and your door gets kicked in by soldiers and a sword comes out and slices off the head of the father of the house and in front of you, the mother of the house is thrown on the ground and physically raped by three, five, six, ten soldiers. Then your little brothers and sisters are snatched up because they're, they're about to be sold. And then you, being a teenager or young adult, you're going to wind up going with these soldiers for forced prostitution, forced slavery. Can you imagine that happening to one house in Huntington County? It'd make the front pages. It'd be on the news all around the world, one house. What if it happened to every house on a block? Would it be big news? What happens if it happens to every house on the block and every block within a town and it goes on for months? What if it went on for a whole year? Can you imagine every house, every block, every town, every village, and not only for a year, but for eight years? What I just described happening for eight solid years, that's what happened to the Armenians. From 1915 to 1923, 1.5 million Armenian men, women, and children were massacred, with another half a million uh, driven into the desert. Uh, this was a very well-planned, intentional, systematic attempt of a complete annihilation. Does it sound like Lemkin's definition of genocide? Sure does. Men were shot, burned, beheaded, women were raped, abused, robbed of their dignity. Women and children were stolen and left to die. Make no mistake about it, this was the first genocide of the 20th century. 
One interesting thing is during the genocide, there was a fellow, he was in the German army, he was a lieutenant, he was uh, part of the medical um, um, office for, for the German army, and he was actually stationed in the Ottoman Empire um, from um, 1915, I believe, to 1917 or 1918. Um, his name is Armin Wegner, and against orders, he took pictures of what he saw. Now, he wasn't supposed to take pictures, the Turks forbid it, but he took the pictures and he hid the film under his belt and he smuggled it out. Hundreds of pictures, and they're all in this book on Amazon, if you're ever interested in seeing them. I have some of his pictures here. They're not very pretty, but we're going to show them, because this is what happened. Armenians were taken from their homes. Either they were killed, like I just described, or many of them were deported. This was the Turks' way of saying, well, World War I is starting, and we have to move you to a safer area. What happened? They were deported to the desert, and on the way, they were beaten, they were raped, they were robbed, and they were left to die. And they had no water, they had no food, no medical attention. This was no deportation, it was really a march to death. And here is a picture that Wegner took. You can see the Turkish soldiers, and you can see the Armenians. There's really no guns, there's no rebelling. These are peaceful people living their life. The march continues, and along the way, Wegner took pictures. What's interesting about this picture? What do you see here? Do you see men with guns and rifles? Are they rebelling? What do you see? You see women, children. And you can see the Turks in the background there. Here's a picture, pretty appalling, but it is what it is. I mean, you have rows of children, and you can see the Turkish uh, military and state's servants going up and down the aisles looking at what child they want to buy. These kids are now about to be bought. They're going to have to change their names, change their religion. And after seeing their parents horrifically killed in front of them, now they're going to be owned by someone else. Very disturbing. Here's a whole bunch of kids just aimlessly wandering through the desert looking for food. Again, they have no food, they have no water, and they've just witnessed their entire family murdered. You can only imagine, you know, the, the, the fear and, 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 the, and the, the pain that they're experiencing. It's a picture, but it's tough to imagine, but it happened. Here, again, no, no guns, no rifles, innocent people. Here's a woman with her baby, a woman with a small kid. You can see the Turkish soldier with the horse back there. These are all pictures from Armin Wegman in, in, in his book. Very disturbing pictures. It is what it is, but I show it. These are kids that were just left to die. Um, here's either a mother or a father, can't really make it out, um, with, um, I believe, a son who just died. This is interesting because look what you have here. You have a bunch of um, Turkish people, and um, this is not a military uniform. It's tough to make out, but I know the uniforms. That's not one. That's a civilian. So these are, I see three civilians walking by a street of one, two, three, four, five kids that are in desperate need of medical attention, food, and water. They just walk right by them. They're Armenians, and they're just meant to die. Severely ill children. Again, no parents, no food, no shelter, no water. Armin Wegman was there with his camera. <clears throat> Deportation marches to the desert along the way, depending upon the Turks that guarded you, guarded you, you would either get marched into the desert and abused along the way and then uh, just left in the desert, or you'll get shot along the way. So this is a, a, a picture of, a, of many Armenians um, that were shot and, and put to death. Very humiliating picture. Here's a, a Turkish state servant, and here's a bunch of starving children, and he's teasing them with a loaf of bread. More children on a deportation march. You can see their, their, their face. They're just absolutely scared to death. They're in agony. And then this is what winds up happening to them. Now, if your memory is good, 
I want you to remember this picture, because later on in this presentation, I'm gonna come back to that picture and you're not gonna believe it when I show you. Just remember that picture. Just kind of tuck that away in your thoughts. More pictures of Turkish soldiers with the killing of people, a, a mother with a child. Here are a bunch of women that were beaten, raped, abused, and they're all put on the cross to die. Again, more Turkish soldiers over many people who were put to death. <clears throat> One thing that you can say was a positive thing is the world started to understand and started to see what was going on with the Armenians and they started to get involved. There was orphanages that were set up on the exterior of the Ottoman Empire. They were there for the purpose of trying to capture as many of the kids as possible and save them. Okay, so um, this is a picture of, of kind of a cattle car. They rounded up all of the kids and they brought them to an orphanage to give them food, water, shelter, and try to figure out how are these kids now going to spend the rest of their life? How are they going to grow up? Here's yet another uh, picture. Um, if, you've, if you know this topic at all, you'll know that the Near um, East Relief evacuated many, many um, um, orphan children. So they did a lot of good um, once the word broke out and people started to understand what was going on uh, in, in this part of the world. And, and here's a picture of, of more of the children that were thankfully saved. Um, here you see children are, are well fed. I mean, there's some meat on their bones. They got good clothing, clean. This is a Danish orphanage. So the, these were the things that were happening. Of course, the kids have no idea, you know, what just happened to their parents or their town. So what happened to the Armenians? Well, basically, 1.5 million Armenians perished as a result of starvation, disease, um, and, and, and the physical abuse. You're talking about people that were in this region of the world for 3,000 years, okay? And the ones that were left in Turkey, and these were primarily people that were on the western part of Turkey, um, as most of the killings happened more central and east, some of them stayed, but they, were, um, they had to change their names. No more IAN, so Ar Armenians, you know, we have IAN in the end of our names, so. They had to change their names, they had to change their religion. They were forced into another family, another religion. Okay, um, so, I'm here today to speak about my grandma, Anna Manugian. She's one of these um, people that actually survived the Armenian Genocide. And um, I didn't really get to know her very well because I was very young. Um, I have a couple of memories of her, making food of course. Um, but my uncle, who was very, very persistent, always kept asking her to open up and tell her story. She never wanted to do it. One day he got her to do it. And he had a tape recorder under the table. And he recorded all of the words from Anna Manugian. And as she was crying, she told her story. And she told it in full. And it was on the tape. And the tape was handed to my mom, who speaks Armenian. And she translated all of the words from Anna Manugian. And I'm here today to read that for you. Not the easiest thing to read. You think I get a little bit easier doing this after my fourth presentation, but I can assure you it's, uh, it's a little tough for me. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get through it. Um, anyway, this is um, Anna's story. In 1915, the Armenian community heard that the Turks were deporting and or killing all Armenians in Turkey. This was the beginning of the Armenian Genocide. At the age of 25, after seeing her father taken from her house by Turkish soldiers and never to return, Anna Manugian decided to flee her home and village to avoid capture by the roaming Turks. As she fled her village, she turned back one last time to view her village and saw the entire village in flames, narrowly escaping the Turks as she knew there would be no survivors. Anna fled to the mountains with her four children and her youngest sister, Zaroi, and with little time to prepare, carried very few provisions. Life became a hardship, as her young children did not understand. This period in Anna's life was the most traumatic and left the horror of the Armenian Genocide in her memory till her very last days. While in the mountains, 
Her children cried for water and food. One of several techniques Anna used to keep her children alive was by taking saliva from her mouth with her fingers, moistening it, and getting the sand underneath her feet and, and feeding it to the children. To ensure her family survived, Anna showed a unique strength and character, but only to have to bury her children one by one. After weeks of living on dirty water and whatever they can find in the mountains to eat, her children certainly did die one at a time. Each time Anna lost one of her children, she dug graves with her own bare hands. She wrapped the children and buried them by covering their bodies with rocks so wild animals would not get to these innocent victims. Several weeks later, Anna and Zarawi were huddled in a small cave. Two Turks spotted them and they took Zarawi. They left Anna and her two remaining children to die as they saw they had little time to live. Zarawi was a good target as she was a young, beautiful woman and Turks were known to save them for themselves or worse, rape and kill them. Anna prayed the Turkish soldiers did not kill her sister, but knowing what Turkish soldiers did to young, beautiful women, she prayed that she just did not suffer. That was the last time in Anna's life that she ever saw Zarawi. Anna's two remaining children now died of starvation, and she was alone, and literally nude. Anna traveled by foot the best she could. The nights were cold, so one day she came across some bodies of women and children who were killed by the sword. She took the blood-stained clothing from a woman and covered herself. Anna continued to travel at night, and as best as she could, she reached villages to get help from anyone willing to help her. During this time, she witnessed many horrors, including Turkish soldiers cutting up dead bodies to see if any Armenians had swallowed gold. She saw boys with their genitals cut off, mutilated bodies of girls, women's breasts cut off, and stomachs ripped open, hands and feet cut off. At one point, she decided to end her lifeless body by flinging herself into a lake with the hope of drowning. There were hundreds of Armenian bodies in the lake as she attempted suicide. She had no more will to live, but somehow, under the grace of God, this was not the time for her to end her life. Strong fortitude kept her alive. One Turkish farmer spotted Anna. While still with life, he carried her back to his home. And there, with the help of four other wives, nursed Anna back to health. Anna, being an attractive woman, was going to be this Turk's fifth wife. One night while everyone was sleeping, she took some gold coins from the Turk's sack and fled to the hills. She had no intention of staying and being forced into another faith. She traveled many months from town to town. Some of the towns Anna was able to walk to were Harput and Ofra. Each place she stopped, she tried to find refuge in a hospital or orphanage, working in some or just helping out for food and a place to rest. The American Red Cross on a small scale was just starting to help. The American Cross, I mentioned the Near East organization as well. Anna saw orphan children and was very emotional as she picked them up, kissing and hugging them as if they were her own children, crying, why did this happen? Why, why? Anna was the only reported female in all of Galdi to survive the Armenian genocide. She never knew about her sister Zarovi, so it looks like she was the only one from accounts around the world, people kind of knowing each other. She was the only person who survived that village. Anna received money through the Red Cross and traveled to the United States. She remembers there being a big iron lady standing in the water with a crown. Every April 24th, which is the Armenian Genocide Martyrs Day, Anna and now husband Margos, that's my grandfather, had a special memorial at the local Armenian church in memory of their families who died from the Turkish sword. Every night, Anna's three children, Mary, Rose, and Sophie, Rose is my mom, Andrew's grandma, had to recite the Lord's Prayer in Armenian and always added, may our parish sisters, brothers, aunts, and uncles rest in peace. Anna used to talk about her life in Galdi and the genocide. She repeated these experiences and made her three girls to promise to tell their children, me being one of them, and their grandchildren, that's Andrew and my son John there, um, how the Armenians suffered. 
Most nights after the girls went to bed, they heard Anna softly crying. Mary and Rose would try to comfort her, assuring her she was in a free country now, and no Turks would harm her. Anna's answer was always, you could never forget. The words you just heard were right from Anna's lips. This was the legacy to her family. <sighs> never easy to do that. Okay, so um, these are the only pictures I actually have of Anna. This is much later in life when she came to the United States. And through the Red Cross, my grandfather Margos actually sent money for her when she heard that she was the only survivor of Galdi. Um, my grandfather, Margos, came to the United States to avoid being drafted into the Turkish army. Little did he know he saved his life by coming to the U.S. Because if he was in the Turkish army, he would have been killed by the Turks. So he saved his life by doing that. Unfortunately, he found out that his wife and kids were all killed. So he stayed in the U.S. and sent for Anna. And they got married. And they had three girls, and one of them is my mom, Rose. And there's Anna. Those are the only pictures I have of her. Let's uh, talk a little bit about how this happened. Because quite frankly, if you know this topic, you'll always hear about 1915, right? 1915 was the start of the Armenian Genocide, but it was the start of the execution of the Armenian Genocide. Late 1800s and early 1900s, hundreds of thousands of Armenians were put to death before 1915. Why is that relevant? You'll find out later when you hear some of the Turkish denial, when they say, well, you know, this had to happen because the Armenians were siding with the Russians in World War I. Well, the killings happened way before World War I. That, in essence, was a lie. Take a good look because this is the face of evil. This is Talat Pasha. He's known as the Turkish Hitler. He's the mastermind behind what happened to the Armenians. And basically, he gave principle to brutal means of transforming what was known as the Ottoman Empire into one nation, one race, one people. There was no tolerance for people of diversity. This was a discriminatory, very prejudiced way of his idealism. And he carried it out to the letter. He was bent on resolving what he called the Armenian question. Don't forget, the Armenians were the intellectual body of the Ottoman Empire. To him, it was a nuisance. To him, they were Christians, and they were infidels because they were Christians. They had to be killed. Here's the same picture of him as well as his military top uh, generals there. These are the three that basically carried out the Armenian Genocide. How did this happen? Well, when he came into power forcibly, um, they were known as the young Turkish government, and um, they basically used 1915, April 24th, to start the genocide, okay? He used World War I as kind of a disguise, as, as, a, as a cover to say, the Armenians are siding with the Russians and, you know, we have to kill them. And of course that wasn't the truth, but that's what he said to the outside world. And he showed absolutely no mercy in terms of carrying out what he wanted to do with his idealism. Okay, so how did this happen? April 24th, 1915, Talat Pasha and his military, they rounded up 250 intellects of the Armenian community. You're talking about all the leaders, all the priests, all the politicians, artists, teachers, composers. He rounded them all up and he put them to, to death. That's how he started. Okay, so it's kind of cutting, cutting off the head and now the body dies. That was his strategy. The second thing he did is he drafted men into the Ottoman um, army. He segregated them and killed them. Again, it happened because of World War I. Of course it didn't. It happened because they were Armenian. Who was saved by coming to the U.S. and not joining the army? My grandfather. This is how people survived. Who was left? You had nothing left but women and children. Those were the only folks that were, that were left. And speaking of the women and children that were left, here's a, a whole row of children. And by 
Um, Dalmal Pasha, one of the three that I showed you, what is he doing? He's basically Turkifying the Armenian kids. They're dressed up as little Turkish soldiers. Their names have changed, their religion has changed, they're forced into another whole life. Can you imagine that happening to you guys? I mean, this is what happened. Not a very nice picture, but again, it shows the 250 people that were rounded up, they were beheaded or they were hung. Wegner was there with his camera. He took pictures of it. He has it in his book on Amazon. Okay, um, again, another picture of the Turkish soldiers with um, the, 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 the beheading and, and the hanging of, of, the Ar of the Armenian intellects. You can see these hats. You see the, the moon and the star there? These are Turkish um, symbols. They're, that's their flag. So it's, there's no question there. They're, they're Turkish soldiers. Talat Pasha made a case to the U.S. Ambassador Henry Morgenthau. We're going to talk about him next, okay? That the Armenians were treasonous and they were betraying Turkey during World War I. A lie, okay? Um, of, of course, this was nothing more than his idea of relocating Armenians, but to put them into the Syrian desert so they can die. And I'll tell you another part of genocide. It isn't just the killing. Because what happened to all the possessions that the Armenians had back in their home? Everything was stolen. It's like going home and everything you own is gone. Including your house and the land. And everything in it. That's part of the genocide. They took everything. During these marches, women and children were so dehumanized, many wanted to take their own lives. Sound familiar? That certainly went through Anna's mind. Civilian Armenians were prohibited to carry any guns. The Turks made their rounds. They took all the weapons. So the Armenians were defenseless. They had no way of even defending themselves. Now here's a really interesting slide. You can almost spend two hours on this because there's so much detail, but we'll just show it very quickly. And for um, the sake of uh, making it easier to understand, the bigger the circle, the more of the killing. So you can see this shaded area is really Armenia. Today, Armenia is just here. But this is what Armenia was. Well, what happened to it? It was taken by the Turks during the genocide. And the genocide was very well systematically planned out. When you see these arrows going into the sea, what is that? That's people getting drowned. People down here being brought out to the desert. There were concentration camps. There were deportation checkpoints. There were massacre sites, okay? There were death march routes. If you take a look at the scale, does this look well planned out and organized? Of course it was. There was no chaos about this. It was very intentional. No chaos about it at all. Another interesting slide. Here's that same area that is really Armenia. And you have Anatolia, which was the name for Turkey way back when. So you could see here was Turkey and here was Armenia and this was all the Ottoman Empire. Well if you go home and you look at your maps hanging up in your basement you'll see Turkey. This is Turkey today. Well guess what? This blue line, I drew that. I, it's not the scale but it's close enough. I did it to, to have this uh, area here to mark the same. You, you, you can see these coves right there are the same as these coves right there. So I did my best to kind of line up the maps to show you what? Literally half of Turkey, from the center of Turkey all the way to the east, is actually Armenia. And this is where Mount Ararat is, right here. And all of the rest, this is all Armenia. But of course today, it's called Turkey. Illegally. Why did this happen? because that's got to be a question everyone's asking. Well, Armenians were Christians, and the Turks were Muslims. So the Armenians were known as kind of infidels, right? Am I talking about something that happened 100 years ago, and that's the end of it? Does this stuff doesn't matter anymore because it was 100 years ago? Well, guess what? This stuff's going on today. This Taliban, this uh, Al-Qaeda, does that stuff ring a bell? ISIS, you guys reading about this in the papers? This stuff's going on today. 
I'm not talking about something 100 years ago. It's going on today. Same type of mentality. Same type of mentality. Killing people over prejudice, discrimination, and religious belief. Okay, the Armenian Genocide was carried out in the, in the name of national and ethnic cleansing. Period. That's why it happened. All right. Why was this genocide relevant? Because you can ask yourself that question. Why is it relevant? It's relevant because someone by the name of Adolf Hitler used it as a template. His famous quote, those, I'm sorry, who, after all, speaks of the annihilation of the Armenians. Hitler said that. He said it right before he went into Poland. He used what happened to the Armenians as a way of getting away what he was about to do. Okay, the Armenian genocide happened. No one was jailed, no one was killed over it. No one was accountable for it. So why can't he do it? And so he did. And it wasn't just what happened to the Jews, it happened to the Cambodians, it happened in Rwanda, Bosnia, and guess what? It's happening in, the, in Darfur today. It's happening. I'm not talking about something 100 years ago. This stuff's going on today. Why specifically is the Armenian Genocide still relevant today? Well, because, again, no one went to jail, no one was punished. Recognizing it is the moral thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's a matter of human morality. It's also the first step in a healing process. How do we move on? How do we get forward with the relationships in that part of the world? How do we extend the olive branch and, and start to build relationships with Turkey and the other countries? The first step is recognizing the past, come to terms with the past. That's why it's important. It's also to demonstra de demonstrate that Raphael Lemkin didn't do all of his work in, in, in vain. He went to bat for people that were uh, un under this umbrella of genocide. Okay, he made it, remember what I said before in the very beginning, he made it a law. It's not like another country can go kill people and, and an outside country can say, well, that's their country, they can go ahead and do it. International law of killing people on a mass scale called genocide is illegal, it's criminal. You're gonna see why that genocide word is so important. Okay, it's also needed to be realized because, you know, we, we can't tolerate the rewriting of history. It's also to set an, set an international tone. This stuff shouldn't be going on any longer, right? We don't want this stuff ever to happen again. And again, today, people still understand. People get away with it, it can continue to happen. I also added this because, to me, despite what happened to the Armenians, it also shows um, a perseverance of, of people that were knocked to their knees. Three quarters of the Ar Armenian people were wiped out. And today, it's still a very vibrant culture. There's so much culture there. The food is back, the music is back. People get together and they have like Olympics and they have all different types of events. They have a, we have a camp in Massachusetts, right John and Andrew, you guys went? It was a great place, you guys loved it. I mean, this is, uh, this is you know, it's, it's amazing that we're at this point after what happened to, to the Armenians. So it shows that perseverance of a people. That's why it's also relevant. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about the acknowledgement of the genocide. Did it really happen? Well, here's Henry Morgenthau. He was the senior America, American ambassador to Turkey from 1913 to 1916. He covered the whole span of the Armenian genocide. And what does he have to say? When the Turks, Turkish authorities gave the orders for these deportations, they were merely giving the death warrant to a whole race. They understood this well, and in their conversations with me, because he was there, they made no particular attempt to conceal the fact. I am confident that the whole history of the human race contains no such horrible episode as this. The great massacres and persecutions. Why is he saying massacres and persecutions and not genocide? Because the word wasn't invented yet. Limkin came around in 1944, right? This is 1915. Wasn't invented yet. The great massacres and persecutions of the past seem 
almost insignificant when compared to the suffering of the Armenian race in 1915. Here's a message he sent as well. Secretary of State, Washington, July 16th, 1915, sent on July 20th. Deportation of and excess against peaceful Armenians. Does it say rebelling Armenians? Does it say Armenians with rifles and guns killing Turkish people? No. It says peaceful Armenians. That's what he wrote. Is increasing, and from harrowing reports of eyewitnesses, it appears that a campaign of race extermination, why doesn't he call it genocide? It's 1915. Word wasn't invented yet. Race extermination is in progress under a pretext of reprisal against rebellion. What does that say? It says that, well, the Turks are saying Armenians are rebelling, so we have to kill them. Of course, that's a lie. You got Henry Morgenthau saying it. Not an Armenian, an American who was there. Now, I'm not going to read each of these for the interest of time, um, but I have this on my website. At the end, I'll show you, so um, if you guys are interested in learning more, but there's a lot of famous people here um, that talk about the Armenian genocide very clearly. Theodore Roosevelt, Herbert Hoover, and then you have presidents. Jimmy Carter, if you guys heard of him, past president, Ronald Reagan, George Bush Sr., Bill Clinton, George Bush Sr. again, because he was in office twice, right? So he, um, so you can see there's a lot of folks here that have spoken out about this. Are any of those people I just mentioned Armenian? No. These aren't Armenian people, you know, with some agenda. These are people speaking out that it happened. Here's another interesting thing. From 1915 to 1922, the New York Times and all of the publications, major publications throughout the United States started writing about the Armenian Genocide. There were articles in all of the papers, okay? Here is a book with all of those articles in it. Anyone who wants to deny the Armenian Genocide, you get this book. It just so happens, I have this book. Here it is. There's over 400 pages in this book. 400 pages in this book. They're all of the news articles that were written about what was happening to the Armenians. Understand, this was the first time the world had ever seen anything like this. And it's all in here from the American press. Not from Armenians, from the American press, as well as global press. Let's switch gears again. Let's talk about why the Turks deny the genocide. Because they deny it today. I'm not talking about just 100 years ago. I'm talking about 2015. The leadership of the Turkish government denies it happened. Despite the vast amount of evidence that points to the historical reality of the Armenian genocide, eyewitness accounts, official archives, photographic evidence, mainly from Wegner, Armin Wegner, the reports of diplomats, and the testimony of survivors, and there are hundreds of testimonies in the, in the uh, in the uh, Shoah, is it the Shoah Foundation? I think uh, um, Steven Spielberg founded that, um, that association. And we have digital copies of all of these testimonies there. Um, denial of the Armenian genocide by successful regimes in Turkey has gone on from 1915 to today. Again, I'm not talking about something 100 years ago. I'm talking about something that is happening today. The Turkish government denies there was a genocide. Millions are spent on creating a debate. Now this is important, okay, because as long as there's a debate, you have the ball in the air. You don't, you're not accountable for anything. As long as you keep it as a debate. Well, they have their side and we have our side. As long as it, there's a debate, no one's going to jail, no one's giving land back, no one's giving money back, okay, because it's a, it's a debate. Well, guess what? It's really not a debate. It happened. But that's their position. I'll also tell you, and it's very disheartening, but they're doing everything in their power to say that the Armenian Genocide was a lie. They're going to the extent of teaching that to students of your age in Turkey today. So while you guys are sitting here listening to me, there are, there are classes in Turkey today, right now, on the other side of the world, where, where teachers are getting up and they're saying the Armenian Genocide is a lie. A lie of the century. I want you to join the fight against the biggest lie ever told. This is what they're doing. Here's the Pinocchio picture. 
I, I figured, you know what, I'm going to show you all of these because they're out there. You're going to you see them if you're interested in this topic. Here they even did a counter uh, march because in, uh, in Washington, D.C., there were hundreds of thousands of Armenians and Christians and human rights groups to protest uh, about this topic and recognition. And uh, the Turks did their own um, gathering right after that to say, well, it, it, it never happened. Here's a cartoon, of course, but it's um, Aragon, who is the prime minister of Turkey today. It didn't happen. That's why we get so angry when you mention it, and he's kind of putting it under the carpet. Here's another cartoon. You know, again, it is a cartoon, but it says a lot. Turkish Ministry of Denial of the Armenian Genocide by Turkey in 1915. Foreign Pressure Office. Adulteration of History Department, Censorship Office, Intimidation Department, Put to Silence Department. Again, a cartoon, but it certainly says a lot. This stuff's going on today, by the way. I, again, I'm not talking about 100 years ago. Um, this, I think, was in a um, South American paper, but I grabbed it because, uh, again, another, another symbolism of all of the people that were killed and the Turks with their arms crossed. Um, here is a, a, a protest that happened in, um, in France recently. That's written in, in, in French, but I can tell you what it says. It says it's, not a, it's, it's a historical debate, it's not a political debate. Well, guess what? It's not a debate, political or, or history. There's no debate. It happened. But again, we're keeping the ball up in the air. Okay, so remember that picture I showed you before? I said, tuck it away in your memory. I'm going to show it to you later. This is about the most appalling thing you'll see. Here it is again. And guess what? This is what it says underneath this picture on a Turkish website. I just saw this about a week ago and I put it into my presentation. Turkish children and women killed by the Armenians. Some of the women were killed by taking the babies out of their wombs. And look, they, they write a date of 1918. This was a picture ta taken by Armin Wegner. It's in his book. This is a picture of Armenian children that were put to death. And this is how far they go with the lie, saying that, that these are Turkish kids. This is what you're dealing with today. The three main lies you're going to hear is, well, this was a time of chaos and many Turks were also killed. Remember the map I showed you with all the deportations and the routes? Did that look like chaos? No. Armenians were killed because they were re rebelling. Did you see guys, uh, Armenians, with guns? You saw women and children. You heard Anna's story. They were certainly protesting. They weren't rebelling. They, they were protesting because they were discriminated against. They had more taxes. They, they didn't have equal pay in the Ottoman Empire. There was a lot of discrimin discriminatory um, measures taken against the Armenians, so they were certainly protesting. So did Martin Luther King. Did you kill every African American because he stands up and asks for equal rights? Of course not, it's absurd. They certainly weren't rebelling, and this is the biggest lie of all, is that they were treasonous and they joined uh, the Russians in World War I. Hundreds of thousands of Armenians were, were killed before World War I. So that blows that lie out of the water. And even if they were Armenians that joined the Russians, is that cause to take women and children and beat them and rape them and march them out to deserts with the intention of killing an entire race of people? At the end of the day, you're, you're, you're erasing evidence, you're falsifying facts, you're trying to rewrite history, you have state-mandated curriculum, um, you're trying to make the Armenians the, the villains. At the end of the day, it's all denial. And denial is the final stage of genocide, and if genocide is a crime, well then guess what? Denial is a crime. So what's going on today is criminal, and the occupation of all of that land, uh, criminal. Why is the denial so strong? Well, they don't want to pay money to the Armenians. They don't want to give the land back. Remember the map I showed you? The middle of Turkey, all the way to the east of Turkey? Do they want to give that land back? This may be two generations of families that are living there now. Armenians are gone, they've been killed. You have Turkish families living there. They don't want to give that back. They don't want to give money back. Reparations and, and, and restitutions are, are what they fear, okay? That's why they deny it. 
There's also other agendas. What about all the Armenian kids that, remember I showed you? They were brought into being Turkish. Um, forced name changes and forced religion changes. Some of them actually know that they're Armenian. Can you imagine if Turks, uh, Turkey admitted to the genocide? All of a sudden you have a whole group of people living in Turkey that want to come out and say, hey, I'm Armenian. They, they don't want that uprising. Not to mention giving credit for a lot of uh, what's in Turkey today, architecturally, the art. Remember, the Armenians were the intellectual center of the Ottoman Empire. That's giving a lot of credit to, to people that they don't even want to acknowledge existed there. And of course, maybe it's a matter of pride. So the denial continues. I will say one thing, though. This isn't an anti-Turkish thing, because there really is a glimmer of hope. As small as it is, I like to hold on to it, and I, I, I hope it grows. And that glimmer of hope is that there are a lot of intellects in Turkey, there are progressive Turks that are coming out and saying, hey, of course this happened. Let's admit to it. Let's deal with recognition. Let's deal with re restitutions and reparations. Let's extend, extend our hand to the Armenians. And let's move on in life. One of those Armenians, um, I'm sorry, one of those Turks that were living in Turkey, who was chief editor for one of the publications in Turkey, who wrote about the Armenian genocide as well as human rights for other minorities in Turkey, was Haran Think. In 2007, he came out with his publication, and uh, well, he was doing it before 2007, but 2007, um, he wrote a bit of, big article about the Armenian genocide and what happened to him. Well, he got shot. That's Haran Dink, and he's laying there dead. Now, why is this picture important? Because I have to tell you, it was really a turning point in, in today's Turkey. Again, this is the glimmer of hope. This is the biggest demonstration ever held in Istanbul, which is the capital of Turkey. Ever held in the history of Turkey. And these people are Turks, they're not Armenians because there aren't that many Armenians left over there. These are Turkish people coming out and saying, this happened and it's an outrage that Haran Think was killed. I mean, there are, I'm sure there are some Armenians there, but mainly these are Turkish people, hundreds of thousands of them. And if this isn't symbolic, I don't know what is. If you look at the elderly woman holding up the sign, 1.5 million plus one. I mean, 1.5 million Armenians massacred in 1915, plus Haran Think. That's a very, um, very strong image with her holding that up. Here's with uh, a picture of me and my, my buddy. He's a, a, a Turkish publisher and human rights activist. I was with him recently. He has been in and out of jail. He has been in and out of courtrooms for standing up in the Turkish society to come to terms with what happened. And uh, quite honestly, uh, he's lucky he, he, he's alive. Well, four weeks ago, April 24th, as it is every April 24th, but this year being more important because 1915, 2015, what is it? It's the centennial of the Armenian Genocide. So there was a lot of people that came out to Times Square. I'll show you more pictures of that later. But one of the speakers that came out was Tanner Akin. And this is a, a Turkish professor. He works over at Clark University here in New Jersey. And I have to tell you, I was right up front with Andrew and we were taking pictures because of our presentation. And I was real close uh, to the front. And there was a lot of speakers this day. I'll show you more pictures of that in a, in a, in a bit. But he was probably the most emotional speaker I saw, and he's Turkish. He was pounding the podium, you can see, if you can make it out, his fist. This is what he says, because he's outraged. Today does not merely mark the centennial of the annihilation of some 1.5 million Armenians. It also marks a century of denial of this crime. The Turkish government continues to deny not merely any responsibility for the horrors inflicted upon Armenian people, but even the fact that it even happened as a Turk, it is from this fact that my sorrow and great shame derive. Here, as I stand before you today, I think I can promise in the name of this, he calls it this other Turkey, to do everything in our power to finally put an end to this denialism. So these are folks that are brave and they're trying to get something done. 
And you know what's really unbelievable is that they're alive to say it. Because people like Haran think, unfortunately, we were killed. Why is the word genocide so important? Again, it's, it's a crime. It's not a crime to commit massacres. You can think, well, massacre is killing people. How is that not a crime? But if you're an outside country, another country killing people, because that's what the government wants to do, well, that's their business. Not if it's a genocide. So the word genocide becomes important. All right? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, why is it tough for the U.S. to come out and say genocide today, President Obama? I can tell you, I showed you before, there were many presidents that have come out and said it. But why hasn't it been renewed? Well, it's, it's a difficult situation for him, to some extent, because Turkey is an ally. We also have an air base over there. That's the big, that's the big one. All right. Quite honestly, if it wasn't for the air base, everyone would be talking genocide, reparations, restitutions for the Armenians. It's because of the air base. They don't want to upset the Turks. Well, quite honestly, all of the countries in the European Union today, France, Italy, Germany, they've all acknowledged the Armenian genocide. So, you know, why can't Obama do it? Um, and those countries that I just rattled off, trade between those countries and Turkey has actually increased since they've come out and acknowledged the genocide. So the Turks can pull back an ambassador and they can get all upset, and you'll hear about it in the paper. Everything is about how they're getting upset, not about the reality of the genocide. But quite honestly, they get over it. And, and another thing, they need the US more than the US needs them. We supply almost all of their military. How upset are they really going to be? Here's another visual. Who decides when America speaks on genocide? This is a Turkish flag on the Statue of Liberty. Should a foreign government decide when we say something as a genocide? It's absurd. Okay, and quite honestly, um, there are millions of dollars going around in bribes for politicians willing to stick their hand out and take the money and deny the genocide. I can rattle them off, but there are, there, there are some. Not many, but there are some who, who do that. And Turkey continues to put pressure. Here's a uh, front page of the LA Times. I, I, you know, I saw this a few weeks ago, and it cracked me up. Front, front, front page, LA Times. Go ahead and defend Turkey. <laughs> Go ahead and defend them. Because the bark is worse than the bite. They'll pull an ambassador back. Maybe they shut the air base down for a couple of days or a week. Okay, they're gonna protest, they're gonna be upset, but they get over it like they've done with all of the other countries. Why? Because they all know that genocide happened. As upset as they're going to be. This was kind of funny because uh, I rarely, I'm not the type of guy to pick up the phone and call into a radio station. I'll listen to it and I'll like bang on the dashboard of my car if I'm upset or, you know, I'll mumble to myself. But this particular time I was listening and they, uh, I knew um, the, the host of the show was going to be talking about uh, Armenian genocide. So I had to tune in. And he, the host actually said, um, well, I don't even know why we have to worry so much about um, recognizing the genocide. It's like holding modern day Germany accountable for what the Nazis did. I got right on my phone <laughs> and I called up and I said, that's not true. Modern day Germany acknowledges what their predecessors did. At least most of them, the government. They were held accountable. You ever hear the Nuremberg trials? They were held accountable. A healing process was allowed to take place. In the end, there's no debate. It's a historical fact that this happened. And, and proper acknowledgement is, is, is due. Okay, so what's happening now? This is the 100th year. It marks the centennial of this, um, uh, of this genocide. And again, there's a continued struggle for truth and recognition, restitutions and reparations. That's what's going on today. Today, not 100 years ago. That's, that's what's happening today. Um, as far as I'm concerned, and most uh, you know, other progressive thinkers, intellects, historians, people who've researched it, people who, 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 who know about this topic, historians have done their part. It's now up to the political leaders to do their piece and, and put pressure on Turkey to look at their past 
and acknowledge their past and make the restitutions and reparations. Now, I can tell you many seek land back, of course. Uh, there's Mount Ararat. That's just a very beginning part of that eastern part of what is called Turkey today. But really, from central Turkey all the way to the east, there are people who want all of that back. So quite honestly, you get zero to 10, depending upon who you speak to. Some want some land back, some want all the land back. Um, but quite honestly, um, there are Armenians that are still living in Turkey. They want to be able to live free. They're still being persecuted today. All right, more of the same there. All right, so I'm going to show some pictures of uh, Times Square. Again, every April 24th, there's a gathering of um, human rights groups and Armenians all around the world. Um, on the East Coast, people from Boston come to New York, um, Pennsylvania, the South, they all kind of come to New York. And they meet in Times Square to tell the world this has happened. And every April 24th, I go with my camera and I take pictures. This year happened to be very big because it was the centennial. So this was four weeks ago in Times Square. Turkey guilty of genocide, Armenian genocide, denying the un undeniable is a crime. There were over 10,000 people in Times Square. This is Times Square four weeks ago. Over 10,000 people. Not just Armenians, by the way. There were other Christian minority groups that were killed by the Ottomans. Assyrians, uh, Greeks were killed, human rights groups, other Christians, people who were just outraged. A lot of people showed up. Here's a sign asking that Prime Minister of Turkey to give the land back. Another sign saying it should be held uh, accountable for the genocide. Land and restitutions are in order. Here's a a banner of all of the countries that recognize the Armenian Genocide, including Germany. Germany has a very, very deep archive of what happened with the Armenian Genocide because they were partners with the Turks in World War I. So they recorded everything. There are archives in Germany of daily events of the Armenian Genocide. Not did it happen, did it not happen, what happened this year or that month. I'm talking about day to day. I spent months looking at it day-to-day -day inventory of what happened. Forget about chaos, there's no chaos. Here's the states in the US, and there's been more over the past few years. Some of these next slides you may not recognize um, some of the um, people, but, um, oops, that's um, Frank Pallone, he's a congressman in New Jersey. Here's Bob Menendez. Um, Chuck Schumer. Here are two um, gentlemen that joined us um, from the four to tell their story of what's going on today, not a hundred years ago. Still going on today. Now, this next slide, very disturbing for me. I was right up front with Andrew and we were snapping pictures. And because I was up front, I was allowed to sit right next to that kind of red rope that you see there. And you can see the, the priests and they were staring up at the podium. This woman staring dead straight ahead and that look in her eyes and the look on her face says it all. She is a survivor of the Armenian Genocide. She's over 100 years old. Um, she may be the only one, I don't know. She was certainly the only one that was physically able to make it to Times Square. And quite honestly, the look on her face, I'm, I'm a big strong guy, right? I was in tears. <laughs> I was in tears watching her because she didn't even look at the podium. She looked straight ahead. She was still in shock. I don't know what she saw or what she experienced, but this woman still lives in shock. Also what's happening, there's a movie out called 1915. Um, it's not a documentary, it's a movie. I haven't seen it yet, but I plan on seeing it. You recall Pope Francis about a month ago came out and used the G word? He wasn't afraid of upsetting the Turks. What did the Turks do? They pulled the ambassador, the Turkish ambassador, out of the Vatican for a couple of days. And then he went back. Big deal. How upset were they? Front page in the Times, as I showed you, many, many publications all around the world. 
There was also a play in, in New York City, um, which I went to see with, uh, with John and Andrew. Um, very emotional play, very moving. And um, we went to see it. And then as we're leaving the Lincoln Tunnel and we're coming back into New Jersey, what do I see? 1.5 million Armenians murdered. Never forget, 1915.us. Big banner, you can see relative to the cars how big this was. I was so excited when I saw it because I had just seen this play. <laughs> and I was so emotional about seeing this play that I'm like, guys, guys, take a look at this banner. I can't believe it. And all I heard from the back seat was, oh, I was sleeping. <laughs> I understand. I'm sorry. It was a long day. Australian Parliament. What's that date? 4-22-2015. Guys, this is going on today. This was a few weeks ago. Australian Parliament acknowledges the Armenian Genocide. Okay, now, we'll switch gears a little bit. We'll get a little lighter. Okay, do we have any headbangers in the room? Any heavy metalers? All right, good for you for raising your hand, me too. System of a down, all Armenian. You know those guys? If you don't, check them out. Um, they were more popular maybe 10 years ago, but they did a whole tour, they just did a whole thing in, in Yerevan to commemorate the uh, centennial. Now, what presentation about Armenians would be complete without showing the princess of Armenia? And who is she? Anyone? Now, I'm done making fun of her because she's actually done more than Obama lately. So, I can't make fun of her anymore. <laughs> Here she is with her sisters and they're at the table um, in the, uh, in the uh, kind of like Washington DC version of, of Yerevan talking to the president and some officials there. And they pledged to continue to struggle for international recognition and condemnation of the Armenian genocide. So I can't make fun of her anymore. Okay, you guys are doing good. You're hanging in there with me? All right, I know it's been long, but we're, we're coming down to the end here. I have, if you're interested in this topic, um, I have a website. It's long, but it's easy to remember. It's ArmenianGenocideSociety.com. If you're interested in, in this topic, check it out. It's, I have a lot of stuff on there of, of interest. Um, here's Eric Bogosian. You recognize him from Law and Order? So he's a big uh, movie star. And now he writes a book about um, Operation Nemesis. That's an interesting book because it doesn't just talk about the genocide. It talks about one Armenian student, just like one of you guys, who tracked down Tala Pasha in 1930s after the genocide ended. He saw his whole family wiped out when he was this high. He tracked them down in the streets of Berlin. And what did he do to him? He shot him. Palat Pasha, dead. He got brought into a courtroom in Germany, tried for murder. He said, how can I be accountable for murder when this guy massacred, again, genocide, you know, wasn't around, the word genocide. This guy massacred 1.5 million Armenians, including my family. They let him go. And it was the first time in Germany they even started hearing publicly about the Armenian Genocide. He writes a book about that. Really cool book. Here's another fellow, Peter Balakian, um, The Black Dog of Fate, another popular book. Here's Jeffrey Robinson. Um, he went to Switzerland with Amel Clooney. You know Amel Clooney? That's George Clooney's wife. Okay, they were in Switzerland to try a case where someone said the genocide, Armenian Genocide didn't happen. In Switzerland, it's illegal to actually say that. It's illegal to say the Armenian Genocide didn't happen. This guy, Penicek, or whatever his name is, he wasn't even a Turkish, uh, he, he's kind of an ordinary citizen, wanted to get on the front page of the news. So that's why he went over there. And they, they tried the case, and very, very powerful. I have the videos of this testimony on my website. Very well spoken, very powerful. Um, and probably the best um, uh, publisher right today is Chris. Um, he wrote a book, it was the New York Times bestseller. You can see all the awards. He's been all over the place. It's called The Sandcastle Girls, okay? Um, for those of you guys that are into Beyonce, I'm not saying I, I necessarily am, but she has a video about The Sandcastle Girls. All you do is go to YouTube and type in Beyonce 1915. You'll see she came out with a video about all the women and what happened to them in the deserts. Um, I never even knew it until I was kind of searching on the internet for um, information and I, I saw her video. She, it just got released. Okay, so now we're winding down to the end. 
I appreciate you guys hanging in with me. I know it's been long. Um, I have some parting thoughts, and then I'm going to show you a really cool video. The parting thoughts, they fail. Why did they fail? Because I'm here. Because he's here. They fell. Anna Manugi and Margos, they escaped. They came to the States. They, they had a family. That family had a family. I'm having a family. They fell. They did not wipe out the Armenians. We're still here. <laughs> okay? Making very significant contributions in the world. Um, very strong culture base and a strong U.S. ally and dedicated to peace. We're still here. I'm sorry, but I got to make a joke about this, Andrew. So. This is Times Square, and I saw her, this pretty young Armenian woman. I says, can I take your picture? I want to put it into my presentation. She's like, sure. So I take the picture, and I'm like, hmm, pretty Armenian girl. And I turn to Andrew, and I say, Andrew, go talk to her. And he's like, that's retarded. I don't even know her. <laughs> Sorry. I had to say it. Last slide. <clears throat> there will never be peace or the ability to move forward on this issue until there's full acknowledgment and in, in some form of restitution reparations. Education and awareness is key to inform. Those informed must push the political leaders to do what is morally right. Soon you guys are gonna be voting. This issue is gonna come up and it may be something that you'll remember because of today, okay? You do the right thing, what's morally right. Can you imagine this happening to your family? That is to acknowledge and resolve, resolve all past genocides, not just Armenian and never allow any genocide to ever happen again. And the very last thing is to remember my grandma's uh, words, you can never forget. I have a short video, I hope you enjoy it. Andrew, if you can play it. Yeah, that's the one. In 1915, the Turkish government decided to kill or expel all members of an indigenous minority group, the Armenians. Turkish armed forces systematically moved to exterminate them and killed 1.5 million Armenians. For the past 100 years, the Turkish government has adamantly denied the genocide and spent millions to cover up their crime. Denial is the last stage of one genocide and the first stage of the next. 1915, a year that will live in infamy. Countless people murdered by hostile infantry. Children still in the infancy. Killed instantly. Mass executions without any sympathy. The Ottoman Empire set fire to Armenia. Killing more people than untreated leukemia. Their mission was the extinction of our religion. So they started nearby where my family was living. My great grandma and her kids fled their town. Her husband and friends had already been gunned down. She escaped, but she lost her daughter along the way. She came to America, held her son, and prayed. Back home, the Turks denied the genocide happened. To say the count was dead, I simply imagine. For a hundred years, their regime holds control. And speaking out, we'll end your life without the world.
I'm Greg Sarian. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's presentation. If we have any questions, I'd be happy to take questions, any Q&A. Don't be shy. <laughs> any questions from anyone? I know some folks got to leave. Questions? Anyone? Oof. You know, I've done this presentation five times. You, you, this first time I got stumped. I'm not really sure. <laughs> the red is blood. Um, the blue is like the sky of the nation. I'm not sure the orange. What's that? Orange is the harvest. The agriculture. Oh, the harvest. That's why I have Andrew. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Good question. I didn't know that one. Any other questions? Yes? So what happens in the humanitarian? Like, I'm precisely concerned about it. Like, how do you... No, no, excellent question. I got to tell you, it was probably, um, I mentioned the, the Armenian camp. It's really a sports camp, you know. Uh, it's up in Massachusetts. I went, my brothers went, my cousins went. I had both of my kids go. It's really a blast. Um, and, you know, uh, I go there and I kind of reminisce when I sit there and they have the picnic with the pilaf and the shish kebab and the Armenian music. And I was there about five or six years ago. Uh, Andrew was there his last year. And someone came up to me and said, you know, what are you doing about, you know, the Armenian cause? And I said, nothing. And it just like a ton of bricks went boom on my head. And I realized, you know, I'm tired of feeling this way and not doing anything about it. So I started to get more, more active, you know, and I started to research and get documents together and I started researching all of the information. Um, and I recently went to um, uh, a big gathering in New York City about two months ago. It was called Responsibility 2015. A lot of people were there. It took over the whole Marriott. And there were all these different types of workshops that were going on and one of them was about genocide education. And so there were simultaneous workshops going on. I went to that one. And I got on a mic at the end, like you're, you're doing here, and I said, I really want to get involved. I mean, I'm not doing anything, and this is something I'm passionate about. So um, someone connected me. The very first slide showed it. It's the New Jersey Commission of Holocaust and Genocide Education, my very first slide. Someone connected me with um, the director. So I called him up, and I said, I really want to get this in front of students, high schools and colleges, so they understand the truth of what happened. And um, he said, um, great, we'll work on it. So I said, I, I'll, I'll try my best to get into the, some of the high schools, and you guys get a real educator that can present. And a week later, I call him up, and he's like, well, why don't you present? I'm like, humming, humming, humming. <laughs> I says, I'm, I'm an IT person. I, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, a teacher. He convinced me to do it, and here I am, five, five high schools later. So. so. Anyone else? Do you have, uh, do you have concerns given what's happening in the Middle East with ISIS in Syria and Iraq and a certain strategic location in connection to the United States that that's going to delay or preclude the United States from doing what you want? Sure. I mean, and that's absolutely the big concern for political leaders. It's, it's kind of walking the tightrope. That's why uh, Jeff, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Robinson's book, uh, if you saw the title of his book, it's called The Inconvenient Genocide, right? It happened, it should be acknowledged, but people walk you know, the tightrope of acknowledging it and, and pissing off the Turks, upsetting the Turks, right? But again, if you look at the European Union, all of the countries in the Union, and this is why Turkey's not in the European Union, they refuse to allow them in because of this. And so they're asking them to come to terms with, with their history. And they themselves have come out and acknowledged the Armenian genocide. Again, in Switzerland, it's even illegal to say it's not happened. There's no Armenian genocide. Um, Turkey gets upset. They pull back an, an ambassador. They, they bring the ambassador back. They do their political dance. You know, um, I think more than any other country, Turkey needs the US. So will they be upset? Sure. The headlines of every paper is going to talk about how they're upset and how the genocide didn't happen. They have billions of dollars to throw at this. The Armenians are this and the Turkish are like that. So that's all you're going to see is that type of coverage, right, and, and how upset they are. They're going to get over it. 
They have to get over it to survive. They cannot be isolated from the rest of the world. So as an American, I can appreciate the air base, but as also an American and also an Armenian and, and being close to this and understanding how it's affect not just Armenians, but other cultures along um, the history of the past you know, century or so, this is something that has to be acknowledged for many, many reasons that I went over today. It should be acknowledged, and if it does get acknowledged, even if it upsets the Turks, they'll get over it, and it's the right thing to do. Yes? Would the land that the Turkish people took from the Armenians be part of Turkey for so long? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, e excellent question. And um, I've, every time I've presented, I think this is my fourth time, that question has come up. It's an excellent question. And the real answer is you have the scale from zero to 10, right? You have some Armenian communities, human rights, other Christian groups, people that are close to this, even who aren't Armenian. And they want the acknowledgement, and that's good enough. Then you have the other people that say, well, it should be a symbolic gesture to at least give back Mount Ararat and the surrounding area. It's very painful for the Armenians to sit in this community and look at this beautiful Mount Ararat of historic proportion and say it's not part of Armenia. Some people want that. Then there are others who want more land and some who want it all, but you're right, without all the Armenians there, it's tough to say we want it all back because it's not like there are gonna be people that are gonna be migrating there. Um, but what's interesting is that you have a group of uh, people, there, Armenians, that can trace back legally possessions that are owned right now by the Turks and the Turkish government. They have documents to show ownership. Um, and one of them actually presented at a high school um, two days ago that I was at. I did my thing and she came up and spoke about her case in Washington. She's actually in Washington, D.C. fighting this fight. She has all the proof and documentation. And she came out and said, I'm not gonna move back there. You know, I'm a registered nurse, I live in New Jersey, I'm, I'm happy, I'm not gonna move my family there, but there's possessions that belong to my family that should be brought back to the rightful owner. So there are people that are tr in court cases right now trying to get possessions back or land back. So, you know, again, it's a great question. I think acknowledgement has to happen. There's no question about that, that's step one. Some form, and one of my slides said some form of reparations and restitution. It's the acknowledgement part that's tough for Turkey because of all these reasons. Yes? Um, the people who are living oh. in the territory that was once Armenian, um, do you think they would want to be considered Armenian if the land was ever given back to them? That's another good question. So I have a very close friend, colleague of mine, who went to um, Istanbul, Turkey, the, the capital of Turkey, April 24th. So we were in Times Square. He took the plane and went to Istanbul. And there was a very, very big gathering in the, in the main part of Istanbul. Again, Turks coming out and acknowledging the Armenian genocide. Um, his comment was that they're very, very kind of reserved, kind of like, you know, very buttoned up and, you know, yeah, I'm Armenian, you know. I mean, he ran into that. There are people that are like, you know, they're Armenian, but they don't really want to say it too loud. They're scared. They're very scared. I mean, this is the way the people live over there. So, and there's many that have changed their names and, you know, religion, and they're considered, you know, kind of, you know, hidden Armenians. So, um, if it was acknowledged, it would give those chance of people to come out and have their own identity, their correct identity, their own identity. So acknowledgement would do that for those people, and I think they would slowly, it's a culture thing, but they would s slowly get some confidence back that they can be who they are and not feel like they have to hide under this you know, umbrella of I'm Armenian, but you know, I'll respect everything you know, that the Turks want me to, to respect. So it's a very delicate line that they walk because then he gets in the plane, he comes back, but those people still have to live there. And, and, and there's still a lot of prejudice going on over there, a ton. And again, the kids that are, or young adults that are your age, they're being taught all these lies. So it's, it's probably, out of everything I've shown, it's probably the most disturbing thing. 
aside from the genocide, the fact that students your own age are, are over there are, are, are learning a lie. And so how can there ever be peace with the people that still live there when they're in school just like you are and the person next to them is, is a Turkish student who's just been fed a week of this propagandist lie? It's very tough for them to, to, to come out, but you know, hopefully one day we'll see it. If not my lifetime, your lifetime, or it happens, so I, I hope so. I'm sorry, to, yes? Oh yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> and it's strong too. It's very strong because that's all they've read. I've met many that didn't know about it and I had to educate them um, and they were willing to learn. I've met some that said, well, um, I'm glad I heard your side, but you know, um, I have my side and there are no sides, there's what happened. And then there were some that, um, really a very adamant about, you know, this is all BS. It didn't happen. And that's how they're taught. I've looked at their books. I mean, the ones that are written in English. It's just all lies. And the government prints it and they read it and they're growing up learning that. It's very difficult. So you try to talk with them, but then I get to a point where I'm like, I'm done. Because <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make much of a difference with this person. Um, but you can see there's a lot of Turkish professors. I think they're probably better than me to speak to, to the to fellow Turks. And I showed some of them, you know. Um, I met them recently and they're doing a lot of work, but unfortunately they get killed or they get thrown in jail. But they're trying to, you know, get to those people that deny um, so that they can realize the truth. Yes. Yeah, it was taken by the government. So, you know, what you had is you had literally, back then, you had um, a farmer who had an acre and he had two cows. Uh, seriously. Overnight, he's got 400 cows and 100 acres. And this is what happened all across from central to eastern um, Armenia. So, now it's two generations later and these people are, 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 are living there. They consider it their land. Uh, my grandma who escaped Galdi, I mean, it's not even on the map anymore. Those two villages I mentioned that she walked through, not on the map anymore. They changed the names of the towns. They just erase what happened. Um, some of those churches I showed you in the beginning, some of them you can still see, some of them are completely demolished and there's something else there now. So um, the, there's been a lot of, again, erasing you know, the, the evidence. So that's what's happened with the land. They also grow a lot of uh, opium and poppy seeds and you know, I mean this is, this is what they're doing with the land there. So, Another question? I, I did see another hand. Did I, did I answer that one? Yeah. Um, any other questions? Anybody? Yes. Yeah, um, no, but it's definitely on my um, agenda for sure. <laughs> um, I'd like to go. I've, um, I've met people uh, in my professional work that have gone there. And it's funny, because these are people who don't know each other and I'll meet them at different conferences that I, you know, I'm involved in for my, my, my work, my, my job. And they say, oh yeah, you're Armenian? I went to Armenia and I'll always say like, so tell me about it. And they all start off with the same thing. We met people and they dragged us into their home so we can eat. I heard the same thing from like five people. So when you go there, you know, your family and you get brought into the house and you know, it's like that's the way I grew up. My mom fed the whole neighborhood. So anyone else? Yes. Oh no. She had no interest. She had a tough time adjusting here. Nonetheless, you know, to go back. Yeah. She never went back. Yes? They, yeah, they, they really have their own agenda. So Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Al ISIS, they have their own agenda. 
um, different than what's happened with the Armenians and, and the, you know, the Armenian genocide. But indirectly they get impacted, like if you look at what's going on with ISIS, there's a lot of bombing that's going on in Syria. In the northern part of Syria, if you look at the map, that's right underneath historic Armenia. So a lot of Armenians were saved in, in, in Syria. There was a lot of Armenians living there. So there's actually, today, um, literally, um, I think a week ago, um, ISIS bombed one of the big Armenian churches in northern Syria. It's been historic. It's been there for like, you know, decades. So they're kind of getting impacted again because of what's going on. Yeah, there's still a lot of prejudice, especially against Christians in that part of the world. Yes? She was 25. Yeah, and uh, Margos, my grandfather, heard about her being the only survivor from, from Galdi. And uh, through the Red Cross, sent money for her because he had learned of his wife and killed, uh, kids all being killed by the Turks. So he was alone in the States. And he sent, he sent for her. She was uh, 25 when, when she came. Um, he was not. He was from another village. Um, I, I, I don't recall the village he was at. That's a good question. I actually want to know that now. <laughs> but uh, no, he wasn't. Yes? Are there pieces of Armenian culture that you feel completely wiped out by the genocide? And do you think that um, the Armenian people can ever be truly free of their heritage? Excellent question. I would say it's not erased. I still see it, but it's been stolen. I'll give you an example. Remember this, John, in the uh, Epcot Center? Yes. <laughs> so we're, <laughs> you remember Andrew? Yeah, so we're at Epcot Center and, you know, all the nations. And so we walk past the, you know, the Turkish thing. And you see the dancing. You remember the, sh the picture I showed you of the women dancing? You know, so they have the same uniforms on and they're dancing to the same music. And so that's a little disheartening to, to, to see that. So it's kind of been hijacked. Um, not lost, but stolen. Um, but again, it's a beautiful thing to see the, the perseverance and the, and the resilience of the Armenian people all around the world, because there's so many around the world because of what happened. The, the orphan kids are now grown up and have families and they're all over the world. And there's a lot of things to kind of bring the people together and they're still enjoying the foods and the music and the culture and it's still very strong. And uh, it's, it's, you know, for, for any uh, group you belong to, it's, it's part of who you are. It's, it's, it's your blood, you know, so it's a, it's a good thing to see and it's, you know, um, but, but some of it gets stolen. There's no question about it. Yeah. Anyone else? Any questions? Yes. Yeah, good question. Actually, it was uh, the Turks uh, at that time basically uh, were, were conquered. It was part of World War I. So um, when World War I finally ended, you know, there was a treaty that was, that was drawn up. And the treaty um, was so that part of land was given to Armenia. Um, if you ever um, Google Woodrow Wilson, 1920, you'll actually see him pointing to a map showing what Armenia really should be. So, um, you know, he, he kind of acknowledges it, but um, what happened in 23, I mean, when World War I, you know, ended, the treaties were all kind of, you know, um, either acknowledged or not acknowledged. You know, the land was never acknowledged by Turkey. They just didn't care what Woodrow Wilson had to say. They just claimed all of the, all of the land. Um, but, but, um, but again, it, it ended because of the end of the war. So. Anyone else? Okay, thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you again.